Welcome to Learn With Lowell. I'm Lowell, a serial entrepreneur, startup advisor, and your host for the show. Every week we discover and speak with experts, scientists, leaders, and artists. Today we are joined with Jessica Dornbush, who is a filmmaker, writer, and producer. We get into her life, work, and particularly discuss Wonder Films' Rifa, which involves police brutality and injustice. Spoiler alert, during the shooting of the film, she also had issues with the cops, and we talk about that as well. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. It tells the Google gods that this is stuff worth listening to. Let's stay curious, learn about Jessica, Rifa, and filmmaking on this episode of Learn With Lowell Show. You've spoken about the impact of your grandparents and their experience with the Holocaust and uh-huh. on your life and your world view. I'm curious, yeah. like, how does that how does that impact your film, uh, filmmaking, being a producer? I feel like uh, Rifa in particular, it's like it kind of feels like the, some of the tones in that movie yeah. uh, are, are similar, but I'm just curious, like, how do you see it actually playing out in terms of like how you do filmmaking? Listen, I, I, I definitely relate to the immigrant experience probably on, a, on another level than, than people that didn't grow up hearing about something like the Holocaust all day. You know, when you're, look, I'm sure my mom, who's the child of survivors, but definitely as the grandchild of survivors, it was, it was a constant source of conversation. It was a constant topic and how lucky we are and how, you know, how, how appreciative we are and how I had to finish my ice cream and I had to finish my food and I couldn't leave anything on the table and those kind of things. So, you know, with Rifa in particular, um, when they brought the project to me at first, I didn't really know much about his life. I knew a little bit, you know, about his death and the case that, that was ensuing, um, with the police, but I, it was only really, and I wasn't really that keen on taking on the project at the time, it was only when I met the family and I, I started to hear their immigrant experience and just how, you know, they came to the U.S. on an asylum visa and they were they were they were doing everything right. You know, they were really playing by the rules. They were constantly scared of doing anything wrong and making a mistake, you know, awaiting their green card. Um, so that 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 was definitely the connective tissue for me. I just felt, you know, it was a time where you know, the news was really loud about immigrants and, and, you know, portraying immigrants in a certain way. And I thought it was important to show that in a lot of, uh, you know, I, I, it was really the irony of the story, you know, the, you know, coming here to save their kids' lives, um, only to be killed by, you know, those sworn to protect and defend. I mean, really, really got to me having been an immigrant myself or my family. And, um, so, so yeah, I think that the Holocaust, um, plays, plays a large part in my thoughts that way. Um, I actually just had an incredible experience with my son. Um, he was assigned a Holocaust book to read in eighth grade. Um, so he read the book and then they had to go on a website and he, you know, that he goes to a secular school. Um, they, he, they had to go on a website and listen to a survivor's testimony. So he said to me, he goes, are your grandparents on any of these websites? And I said, well, I think they, I think my grandmother, my grandfather never talked about it because he lost his entire family. I think it was just too much for him to ever speak about. Um, He eventually wrote a memoir, but he never spoke about it. Um, But I said, I think my grandmother is on. Uh, So we went on the one in Israel on Yad Vashem, which is the the Holocaust Museum in Israel. And she was there. Um, She, she said it in Spanish. So I had to because my grandparents eventually ended up in Uruguay. So I I had to translate for him from Spanish to English, but it was an incredible process for me since my grandmother passed away a couple of years ago to hear it from her mouth. I had never really, I I had always heard it in bits and pieces. I had never heard it, you know, uh, chronologically the way that she spoke about it there. Um, And it was, it was really, really, really incredible. It was, it was a beautiful experience to have with my son um, where he actually, you know, he, he, I think he felt it in his bones in a way that reading a stranger story just wouldn't, wouldn't, you know, have had that same effect. Yeah. That makes, yeah. it sounds really beautiful um, yeah. to have that experience with him and um, to also be someone that they know, you know, it's like, not like some, you know, yeah. person number three or something or like Sarah in yeah, accounting, exactly. like it's someone that they know. It um, is. It is. Yeah. It yeah. almost it almost felt it almost felt like a like a story that'd be in a movie, you know, like a kid just going about his life. And right. you like hear the stuff tangentially and then he gets exposed to it. Right. Um yeah. Yeah. But life yeah. is a story. It, it is, it is, for sure. And you know, I think another thing is um the idea of hunger for me really, really kind of affects me to my core. And I never really understood why it, it affects me so much, you know, the thought of especially children being hungry. Um, and I think it was probably that I think it was, you know, growing up in a household where it was so much about, you know, you can't leave any food, you can't do this, that, um, you know, my, my grandmother always saying how hungry they were for so many years, you know? Um, so anyway, there's, there's definitely an emotional response to that, probably mm-hmm. in a stronger way. 
Yeah. And then um, the Reba story is interesting as, as well um, because, in, in my opinion, that, like, I think they left Columbia because there's, like, tyranny going on. They come to America where there's not supposed to be that type of thing. Right. And then they face tyranny by yeah. police officers. And it's yeah. like, I, I don't know how many people listen in feel about immigrants, but I, I love that people can come to America and become Americans. Yeah. And it feels like it feels like a betrayal of like what America stands for, that that type of stuff can happen to people um, who are marginalized and stuff like people should be able to come here and have opportunity and stuff. Not like that police officer who like I, I just kept writing when I was watching the film, like, what is this problem? <laughs> what, right, what is right, this problem? Right. Like, can you calm down? Like, it's just graffiti. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and ironically, he was an immigrant himself, you know, but mm. he, listen, at the end of the day, we're all immigrants here, you know, and it's you know, that that police officer in particular, I really found it fascinating only because at the time with everything that was happening politically in this country, when I not at the time that that he was killed at the time that I was writing the film, um, I found it fascinating that so many of our friends, especially here in Miami, are immigrants themselves, first generation immigrants. And they were so opposed to more immigration. And I just mm. I, I I couldn't fathom that type of hypocrisy. I couldn't even like wrap my head around it, you know, and I guess the way they explained it to me and the way that that police officer felt um, and it happens a lot in Miami, you know, Cubans have been here for for much longer than other Central Americans or South Americans that have been you know moving in in, in masses in the last couple of years and they feel more more deserved to be here, you know. And it's just, it's, it's something that that requires a whole separate conversation and a psychology to it that I, I can't really understand. Um, I don't, I don't know how an immigrant has an issue with another immigrant, but um, I guess it is what it is. Yeah, I think I was reading once that sometimes if like, a, a, like a, a work environment, it's like all men. And then yeah. there's like one woman, like sometimes the woman will get mistreated based uh -huh. on her gender. But then if like it becomes the opposite way where it's all women and then a man that they start yeah. doing the same thing back to them <laughs> or no and in addition like sometimes when the woman gets promoted up she'll be mean to yeah. other women right like instead of being like hey let's lift the yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah it... i'm sure that's true i i do it's weird I, yeah. yeah i i think it you know it's like, it, like depends just like in you know any circumstance but um yeah i've definitely had that experience multiple times you know where some some women in power are wonderful and all they want to do is help other women rise up you know and there's others that, you know, maybe because they feel like they had it really hard getting there and, you know, you need to have it hard too or whatever. But um, yeah, definitely happens. Sometimes I feel like, um, like when people talk to me, I ask like, if someone's being mean to me or whatever, I think, who are they talking to right now? Because sometimes people are just yelling, that people are like reverberating something, like a conversation that happened to them. Like someone was mean to them, so they're being yeah. mean to someone else and being mean to someone else. So yeah. when they, like maybe like these women, or these immigrants are being mean to other immigrants or women um, because they're like, they're seeing in them the pain that they went through. And so right. they're, like they're exhibiting on them versus being like, Hey, I went through this, I should process this and not do it to other people. It's like, they didn't have any like outlet for it or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think, you know, isn't it the, 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 the oldest story in the book, you know, the high school bullies being bullied at home or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. As you travel America, does that uh, immigrant sentiment change? Like to, like if you're like in midland America, or whatever are do, do people view immigrants differently i don't know Just in your experience. you know I, yeah. I don't really know i i look all i can tell you is when i was in high school and i was i was a debater and and i traveled all around the country i mean but again this is a long time ago there was no internet you know there was it was different type of information um constantly people were like wait you're Latin and Jewish. Like, how does that even work? I mean, that was the the, the biggest question mm. I had all the time. Like, it was just, especially people in, in other parts of the country where either there wasn't a huge Latin population or there wasn't a large Jewish population, you know, but but the thought that one person could be both, you know, and there's there's actually a huge, I mean, there's, there's huge numbers of Latin Jews, you know, primarily because post Holocaust or even going back post inquisition, you know, they, they, they ended up kind of making their way into, into South America. Um, but I, you know, to answer your question, as far as the immigrant experience, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I, 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 I always found it funny, you know, I go to LA a lot and in, in Miami, you get a lot of Central Americans, you know, coming into Miami. Um, in Los Angeles, you get more Mexicans coming into Los Angeles, just, you know, from where the borders are. And, I, every time I go to LA and, and I see a Mexican and I ask them a question in Spanish, 
you know, I, I, I love watching like their heads do a double take, you know, they're like blonde, blue eyed, you know, speaking to me in Spanish. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's always very funny, but it doesn't happen that much in Miami. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, do you, in, in the movie, there's, um, it kind of felt like there are times where I almost felt like a Hamilton musical was about to start, uh, like the rise up, like I need to like have my shot and stuff. I, like, right. was that influencing you at all? Cause I just felt like as the character it was, you know, talking, I was like, man, the, I just feel like he's about to start dancing. Like, uh, that's Lafayette's so about to come in. I don't know if that's like, you were just yeah, like listening to funny. Hamilton soundtrack in your free time or not, or if, uh, to the extent I, that interest. Uh, I have listened to the Hamilton soundtrack many, many times. Um, but no, not, 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 uh, consciously. <laughs> Yeah, I just there was like um the first like two thirds was just like I feel like there's a Hamilton musical here just waiting to That's come out. Really funny. Which is like yeah, it's such a uh it's um That's actually like, coming in part two. There's a musical version. Oh, okay. Uh, no, there no. is a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> the exactly. ending is not happy. happy in that one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um but uh did you did you feel like you were forced to be an ambassador for the two different groups that these that people saw you as representing? You're saying in it with the film? Oh, uh, sorry. I, I jump around a little bit. My apologies. I, that was a, t a poor transition. When you would go around and people would say you're Latin and you're Jewish, did you feel like yeah. you had to be an ambassador for both? Um, you know, funny enough, at the time, no. At the, I, you know, I, I think it's become honestly, I'm both. I'm both fronts, sadly, and I don't know if social media is is to blame or just life is to blame or whatever. Um, Sadly, th those are topics that are much more um, controversial now, you know, and, and there's a lot more anger. Um, I don't know if it's because my generation was still kind of one step away from the Holocaust generation. So the, you know, antisemitism was was very quiet. I mean, it always existed, but it was much quieter um, when I was in high school. Um, and the and same with with the with with being Latin, you know, it's like people respected the immigrant experience. Um, I don't know. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I feel like there was a there was a different level of discourse on all fronts back then. You know, when when I was watching the State of the Union the other day and it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I it doesn't matter where anybody stands politically. You know, I I'm personally am, am really to the center of most things. And I just I was watching the heckling that was happening and I'm. I, I was so I was so disgusted by the entire experience because I'm sitting here thinking like it doesn't matter like he's still your president you know it's it's um, so anyway that 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 never used to happen you know there was always a respect for the the office of the president there was a, a respect for the immigrant there was expect a respect for the Jew and and um, I don't know over the, over the years the the anger the vitriol the 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 nasty language has become much louder and much more commonplace so maybe it always existed it was just done in quiet rooms um whereas now you know the internet has given it a megaphone yeah i know the i believe that the like the downfall of the, the american president respect i think it started with nixon mm -hmm. i think people like after nixon did his stuff like people stopped trusting presidents as much and to some extent i feel like the like police officers and i mean i think they all shot body cams and stuff but for like people's frustration with police officers um it's kind of like a symptomatic uh, it's like a, a symptom of a larger problem that people have a distrust with the government right? and how like, like they're just like one example of like a ton of authority and you know, the word means more and like yeah. they, nothing they say can work for you. <laughs> and right, right. Like, like, yeah. Right. Which is sad because at the end of the day, as, as screwed up as we might be, you know, and as screwed up as our government might be, you know, when my husband's family is from Venezuela and I, I lived there for a couple of years when we first got married and my, my, family personally is from Uruguay and, and they go back there quite a bit. When you look at other governments, like true, true, corrupt, dictatorial governments, I mean, we we have a really good system in place. I mean, it's not perfect. It's got a lot of issues, but for the most part, we can trust the system, you know, for the most part. Yeah. Um, so, so it is sad. I, I feel like sometimes people don't, don't realize what the alternative is. Yeah, that's why I, I like it if people could travel a little bit more, but then it's like a financial thing. Most people, right. like, I think most Americans can't afford like a $500 random cost. Right, right. Like that's how they're on the edge they are. Yeah. Um, yeah, if they just went to other places, it's not that you can be like, oh, you know, accept what you have. But like, I think appreciating it more, appreciating the fact that exactly. the predominant number of police officers aren't bad people. Like even right. in your film, there was the other right. police officer who was kind of like, hey, uh, I think you're going too far here. And he kept yeah. 
yeah. the, guy, the other guy was clearly a supervisor. So he's like, yeah. probably was being trained or something. Right. And so he had like that power dynamic where it's hard. Like he kept saying like, Hey, you might want to stop this. So like, right. which I really liked that in the film. I don't know to the extent, like there was another police officer there in the story, but um, I did like that. Like even in the, in the story itself, like there's in the police officers, they wanted to counteract yeah. it. Like, Hey, you're going too far. Yeah. I mean, sadly in the real story that the, the good cop didn't exist. Um, mm. but I, I did think it was my responsibility to, to show, to show that, I mean, listen, <coughs> selfishly, sorry, I'm getting over a cold. Um, selfishly, I, I felt that from a creative standpoint, if I didn't show that the other cop was a caricature, you know, it, it, yeah. it was so over the top that, that he was, it was going to, it was not even going to seem real, you know, unfortunately in real life, the guy was a caricature. I mean, you know, all the, a lot of the stuff that he said was taken from things that, you know, were heard over the radio and, and real testimonies. So I, I had to find that balance, you know, um, creatively. And I, and I thought that it was my responsibility to show that there, there are, there are, there are more good cops than there are bad cops, you know? Um, and it's about finding a balance to the system and, and weeding out the bad ones, you know, the ones that are corrupt with power. But listen, I mean, it keeps happening. We, we, it's all over the news right now. Yeah. I wish there was a, uh, <laughs> I'm having someone from the FBI on, so maybe I, I can get some insight into like what they need, what what do good cops need to like weed out the bad? Where like I feel like with unions and stuff from the outside, what I've read, it seems like if there's a bad apple, they're just forced to sit there and rot with it. Right. Um, right. Which that I mean that's horrible to anyone. Um, there was there's an architectural thing where you get a, a painting and you're required to like start drawing out the rest of the painting as you think it would exist. And I kept wondering like. I wanted to just like see that guy's home life. The police officer just like go home and like, how does he treat his wife? What does he right. like with his kids? I just, right. and I started imagining like, is he just a jerk wherever he goes? Does he, can he ever turn it off? That's something maybe, I- Maybe not, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, listen, I mean, think about the old adage of like mob bosses were wonderful yeah. fathers and community mm. members and and whatever, you know, usually things are, are you know, complex and layered and, um you know, for him, it really, the guy, the guy's crazy. And, and the real life guy is even crazier than the one that I showed, you know, but, but this guy, he, he, he loved his city. I mean, he really, like, it really bothered him. I mean, he's nuts and he killed someone for it, but, but there are usually layers to the reasons that people are the way they are. Yeah. It's interesting to, to the extent you can like to peel back layers and understand people more. Uh, that's yeah. that's one of the I think one of the tragedies of police officers is that the police officers that I know it's really hard for them to turn it off. Like there's the there's the way you have to go about in public to be the shield that lets people feel like they're safe to go about their lives. Especially in Wisconsin, people keep like running people over and stuff, and doing crazy stuff up here. But um, there, I'm sure this happening everywhere else as well. Really? I'm just not familiar like with it. People over? Yeah, there's a guy uh, last year who I think he broke up with his wife or something like that, and he just there was like a parade going on. He just ran people over. He just, I think he wanted a suicide by cop, but they weren't doing it. Um, wow. uh, yeah, I think he was facing jail. He just kept uh, irritating the judge, if I remember correctly. But I might be conflating two different ideas. But <laughs> the, the police officers that I know, it's like when, they, when they're doing their job, and when they're at home, it, it's really like, it's, you can see that they, it's really hard for them to, to, to go from like, I need to be in a, I need to speak in a certain way so right. people know like I'm the law. Right. And when they go home, it's like, you, it's still there. Like, it's really hard to like, you can talk with them, but it's like, it's kind of like, it's like you, you talk in like a weird way with them sometimes with Absolutely. the ones that I know. I never really yeah. thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. They don't turn it off. It's, yeah. it's, or like, it's like, if it's a hundred percent at work, it's maybe like 70% at home in terms of like, they can break down by 30%, yeah. but I've never seen them. Like I've never seen someone who's a police officer to be able to just sit there and enjoy their day. You don't think they get home and the wife's the boss? Uh, uh, well, the, some of the police officers I know are the women and they're the same wherever they go. Yeah. Um, that's really yeah. Funny. Uh, yeah. My, my, uh, there's a person in my family who's a police officer uh -huh. and, uh, she, I think she's like total like four or five different cars. And I, I mean, at a certain point, well, it's like, she'll be going to, uh, like help someone who's, you know, messed up from a car accident or something. Uh -huh. And she's has the siren on and then someone always thinks, oh, it's, I can pull out. That, that oh. everyone's getting out of the way. That means I get to pull out. So they pull out and they start, they flip her uh, squad car. No. <laughs> yeah. Wow. People are very inconsiderate. They think, oh, everyone's getting out of the way. That means I get to go. It's like, no, crazy. there's sirens behind you. Stop it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, crazy. It, it's terrible for her. I think she has like uh, tons of uh, 
uh, brain problems now because of it. Like she has uh, trouble remembering things. But um, oh, did you uh, in 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 Miami? Did you face any pushback from like the police officers? I think when you're when you're shooting on location, one thing that you have is that there's a like I think you have to work out a deal where like someone comes to make sure everything's okay, like from the police department. Um, I'm not familiar with this process, so if, if no police yeah. officers had to be there, you correct me. <laughs> but I feel like there there's some police presence that has to be there if you're like blocking off streets and stuff. Um, yeah. Did you face any pushback from them or? or or was it everyone, were there any problems in that arena? Yeah, no, there was major problems in that arena. Um, I never wanted to shoot the film in the area where Rifa was killed. I, I Because of that reason, I kind of wanted to stay away from that police department. I mean, it's notoriously a tough police department. So yeah. I thought we would go to a different county or even a different city or whatever. But um, one of our producers knew like a real estate developer who was redeveloping a lot of that area. And cinematically there, there was so much texture to those rundown buildings that it was, it was yeah. beautiful, but I was still a little weary. They met with the chief of police, the chief of police gave him a permit guaranteed that we would be fine, you know, yada, yada, whatever. So um, we start shooting. We were going to be shooting in that area for about a week. It was the only scene in the film that we were shooting uh, sequentially. So we started off on Monday night, you know, shooting the beginning part where he and the friends are kind of messing, messing around. They start, you know, graffitiing the wall. One starts going here. The other one starts going there. So we got through a lot of that. Um, Tuesday night, we're shooting a lot of Israel painting the wall, you know, things that start to happen. We shoot this scene with the cops, you know, in the, in the restaurant. Wednesday night, I get to set and um, they tell me that some of the gear had been stolen from the camera truck. So they were, they were going to need to call the cops, you know, to, to fill out the, the, the accident, the theft report or whatever. So I'm like, okay, I wasn't really paying attention and I'm working with the actors. And at one point I see like a police officer out of the, the corner of my eyes, I'm working with the actors. And I don't know, there was something about it that seemed weird to me, but I, 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 I can't really remember what that was at the time. Anyway, suddenly there's, two more police officers and then four more police officers. And then they're yelling and I'm, I'm turning around. I'm, I'm with the actors and they're like, get the fuck out of Miami beach, get out, close this set down. Don't ever come back. So none of us really know what's happening. And the crazy thing is, is that night we had like four cameras and we mm. had like cameras everywhere. Nobody got this on film. Cause I think wow. everyone was just like, nobody really understood what was happening. So we, we call lunch, you know, you have by union rules, you have to call lunch. You know, I think it's six hours after you start production or something or four hours we call lunch early, um, which at this point now it's almost midnight or one in the morning. And we just to regroup and try to understand what's happening. So they tell us that they called the cops in. The cops asked some production assistant what the film was. And, you know, the production assistant, not using probably the best judgment in the world, told them what it was instead of just saying, oh, it's a film about an artist or whatever. Um, and they freak out. They, you know, call the rest of the police force. So wow. our producer calls the the police chief and the police chief is like, I'm sorry. I didn't know that that's what the film was about. And when I wouldn't have issued the permit. Um, and they're like, leave, leave Miami beach. Cause the police are going to harass you. Like you, you got to leave. So this is getting into a little bit of film speak, but it gets really tricky, right? So you have a, you have a set about a hundred people. It's not like tomorrow we could just go somewhere else and continue shooting this scene. A, we need to find continuity and try to figure out how to make these two scenes match. Um, and B, you're, it's a relatively big set. You can't just show up somewhere. I mean, these are permits that take weeks. So we, we spend the entire night awake. I mean, we're, we're pretty devastated at this point. We don't know how we're going to do this. We're a tiny film, very small budget, everything we've done, all these permits have been done way ahead of time so that we would be able to, you know, do this. I mean, it was just, it was so tricky. So, um, this is where the film, Miami film community really shined, um, we we knew this one guy who has like a mini studio in Wynwood um, and he basically called him and he basically said, I have a music video shooting here tomorrow. I just spoke to them. They're they're going to postpone it for a day so you guys could have the studio and just give you some time to regroup. So we took the entire crew there. I had to figure out at about three in the morning what scenes I could shoot at this studio that were never supposed to be at the studio and where in the studio we could shoot them. We show up at the studio the next morning, wake up the actors that now have to be in these scenes the next day that weren't going to shoot for another week. Um, and the other problem was the 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 office, the, the actor that was playing the officer, we were losing him in two days to another production. Anyway, whatever. Fast forward. Um, we get to the set. We still have no idea how we're going to finish the entire end of the movie at this point. Um, and 
a couple of the biggest location scouts in Miami show up at the studio without us calling them. And they say, you know, we heard what happened. It's bullshit. Like you had a permit. You should have been allowed to be there. Um, we're going to help you for free. So they said, show us what you shot until now. And we're going to find a place in Miami that matches that. And they did. Wow. And they took their army of interns and went around Miami without us paying them a dollar and literally went around until they find a lo found a location that somewhat matched the previous location. Um, and we had about four hours to get 500 signatures and they sent interns all over, like knocking on doors and, and we got it. And so the next day we were at this new location. Um, so I had to figure out how to make this, these two locations match a little bit, you know? So I thought, well, we were able to shoot up until the point where the cop grabs him and throws him against the wall. So if I cut to his feet and have the cop drag him for a bit, by the time he picks him back up, we don't really know exactly where we are. Um, and that's it. And so we have his feet dragging, he picks him up. And by the time he picks him up, we're in Hollywood, which is about 25 miles from we shot the first part. Wow. But it was, it was tough. It was not easy. I mean, and, and it was unfair. And honestly, for me, it speaks volumes about Miami and the Miami Beach Police Department because, you know, there's a film that came out a couple of years before us, Fruitville Station, and it was about, you know, a, a killing of a, of a young black man at, at the BART station in San Francisco. And when they went to shoot that film, the San Francisco Police Department said, you know, we messed up. We we it was it, it was on us. So come shoot the film. We're going to support you. And then Miami did the complete opposite. Yeah, it's strange how people decided to double down. There was a, I think I was yeah. recently reading that uh, like a, a little girl was being bullied at school and she went to the administrators for help and they didn't do anything. So she killed herself. Yeah. And then the administrators like doxed and like released private information of the lady saying it, it was her fault. Right. It's like, I don't know, like she's being bullied and like it was being recorded being bullied and she went to help. And then like the people instead of saying, hey, it's our bad. They're like saying it's her fault it's like yeah i don't know how many bo uh, people being bullied is it's their fault for being bullied that's a yeah, terrible exactly. well logic. It's finally now that in that case the the superintendent finally resigned um Good. i think he he or she was the one that said um tried to blame it on the girl and got so much pushback that finally they had to resign which is great i mean you know yeah it was just it was weird to i think they literally like the superintendent person like said the individual's names like normally they keep it private and they just right opened it all up, which is extremely inappropriate. Like grounds in and of itself of a fire, and even 100%. if like something bad didn't happen to the lady. Exactly. Um, the, how can a police officer, how can the police just revoke a permit and have no, re, re, like nothing happen to them for it? Like, I feel like if it's all done, yeah. you're making a film, like, you know, they should eat hay. So basically they, they did have something to hang their hat on. I mean, they, no we they something that is so small and irrelevant that it would never happen in a normal situation um it but it but they did have something so we in the scene that we were shooting the cop um the the actor cop was running after Rifa with a fake gun okay i mean mm -hmm. real fake gun you know and um so when you do that you're supposed to have a police officer on set even though it's a fake arm you're you're supposed to have a, a police officer so it was during Memorial Weekend in Miami. Memorial Weekend, for anybody that knows Miami, is a crazy weekend. Um, multiple shootings happen all the time. It's it's a, it's a tough weekend in Miami Beach. And so all the off-duty cops that we called to try to get on our set, everybody was booked already. So we couldn't get an off-duty cop. So what our stunt coordinator said is, in a normal situation, had this happened, had the police shown up and somebody was using a fake arm, they would have shut down the set for the night. They, they could have said, you know, until you get an off-duty police officer, you can't shoot this, you know, which would have been completely legitimate and okay. So we would have gotten one, you know, hopefully somehow probably paying more, you know, to come the next day. It was the fact that they were yelling at us not to come back. And we were told literally not to come back. That is the part mm -hmm. that is, is extremely just illegal and unethical. And, you know, again, speaks volumes about who they are as a police department. Yeah. Yeah, they sound like a uh, coward if they don't like if, if they stand behind their actions, they should let you do whatever. That's some of the um, nice things about America. You can like, yeah, you, you should be able to say bad things about exactly. your government and the government just has to sit there and be like, you know, what, maybe maybe you have a point there or just, you know, say like nothing because yes. that's kind of their job to take it, which 
it's hard, you know, given where you're, depending where you're at, like if, if you're getting hit all the time, but it's also a part of the job to know how to speak to people and work with them. Right. Um, yeah. Right. I wonder if, if you, if you just didn't have the gun and it was just holstered the entire time, would they have just ignored it? Like if you, if you just changed that one detail, Well, the, you know, the fact is they got lucky um, that mm. that was happening at the same time that they found out what the film was about because they were able to, to claim that as a reason mm. um, when the reality is it had nothing to do with why they were shooting us down. Yeah. Uh, if you were to do a film like this moving forward or a documentary like this moving forward, would you name it? Like, so in Star Wars, when it was really successful, I think by the third one uh, in the 80s or 70s, I think it's the 80s. And the, so George Lucas, when he would go to like get lumber or whatever, people would start charging him two to three times more because it was like, oh, it's Star Wars. I can, I can gouge these people. So he changed the name of the movie to like Blue Harvest so that no mm-hmm. one would be, no one would know who it was and they'd, oh, that's they funny. would leave him alone. Yeah. Would you do something like that if you were uh, making a film like this? So like even a production system, like, oh, this is Blue Harvest. We're just talking about nothing. So no one knows. Yeah, you know, I mean, it probably should have been a good idea. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but you know, we, I mean, listen, for most of us, you know, that we're, we're you know, let's say like the higher level crew, I, I would think it was pretty obvious, you know, but, you know, again, I can't blame a production assistant. They had no idea. And, you know, they, they don't know all the intricacies that went in you know, behind the scenes or, or whatever, but, um, yeah. yes, probably a better idea to have named it, you know, I don't know, whatever, you know, the Smurf movie part three. Yeah. yeah. And at the same time, like uh, a person in authority is asking a production assistant a question. So right. it's very hard for people to say, no, that's, that's why I think like most, most, uh, officers and lawyers are like, don't talk to is as, as unfortunate as it is. It's like, yeah. don't talk to a police officer. Um, yeah, which sucks because that there are people too. But at the yeah, same time, exactly. it's like I mean, nothing you say so, is useful. <laughs> right, right, one hundred percent. I mean, the truth is, this was such a tiny movie. Even yeah. our production assistants were doing this for free. I mean, every mm. it's hard to criticize someone who was doing this out of the goodness of their heart. Everybody yeah. really just wanted to tell this story. People were working for a scale that they haven't worked for in twenty years. You know. Yeah. Well, I, I think if you if you were to do it again, definitely you know Blue Harvest or you know Papa Smurf the Third or something. <laughs> I, I would never do it again, but I'll 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 keep that in mind. Yeah, I think in one of your interviews that was about a year or so ago, you said that you're probably going to move to comedy, but I think it was facetious. So <laughs> what what do you see? Are you going to talk about more injustice like this moving forward, or are you going to try and find I don't know maybe like a Shakespearean comedy or yeah. something? You know, it wasn't so much the 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 topic that was hard; it was it was hard. It was hard that, that he had died so close to the time that I started writing the film and that he, he was still very alive in his family's mind and in his friend's mind. And there was a lot of balancing that had to come with that, you know, um, rightfully so. So, so uh, it's okay to do, you know, a hard topic, but you need to be able to have the creative freedom to tell the story in the way you need to tell it. You know, um, it's hard enough to try to tell 18 years worth of a story into, you know, 96 minutes. Um, and to, to have the pressure of everybody kind of watching your every move and making sure that you're telling it in the right way, you know, is, is, is double as hard and having no budget is triple as hard. And it was the combination of, of all of those that I nearly killed me. Um, <laughs> but it, you know, it's, I, I felt like a huge, a huge amount of responsibility to his family. Um, and I'm so, I'm so grateful for them for allowing me to tell the story. Um, but at, at the same time, I, I going back now, I, I wish I had been stronger in, if you allow me to tell the story, I need to be able to tell the story in the way that I see fit and you, you can't be involved, you know, and as mm. hard as that would have been, it probably would have made everything else a little bit easier because ultimately we did end up having to come to that point. You know, Um, I invited the family to the first set to the first day of production. I always wanted them involved. I always wanted them to know what we were doing. I guess I didn't, I didn't realize how hard it was for them to see another actor portraying their son. You know, I, I, I really wasn't maybe empathetic enough to that. And I thought, okay, I'm going to invite them to the scene with the lawyer um, that was what we were shooting as the first scene. Um, and it was relatively innocuous scene, you know, but it's still not their son. You know, it's still an actor portraying their son. And he's still not going to exactly talk like their son or look like their son or dress like their son. And there was a lot of emotions that came with that. And so eventually we had to tell them that, you know, to please like not come back to set and wait until the film came out. Ultimately, they were really happy with the film. I mean, really, really happy with the film. And they were, you know, they were so grateful 
that I had shown their son in that way, but, but it was a hard process to go through. Yeah. I, I feel like it, it, from their point of view, up and up until like the last, you know, uh, 20 minutes, it's kind of a gift. And yeah. so um, when someone, when people have died in my life, they um, like, when you tell stories about them, it's like they're alive again. So like right. for the two thirds of the movie, it's just their son, right. you know, trying to be the best they can. And so it's yeah. like kind of a gift in that way. Yeah, that they have it, this. Is. It, it, it is. I think so. You know, um, but but at the end of the day, it's you're still reliving it, you know, and and mm-hmm. I think it's hard to find that space. Yeah. Get out of your spam. Thought I'd turn that off. Um, I don't know about you. I get like robo spam all the time, which should not exist. Oh, yeah. I think that should, should have laws against that. Um, so. So. Um, yeah, I think you were talking about one, uh, this in one of your previous interviews, how it was really hard, just like the, the timing of it. And um, so I. But I guess to the to the to the question, and maybe you're, like you're still living in the post of this yeah. movie because I think it's only a couple of years old. I don't yeah. know. Um, I I suck at dates when it comes to things. So, um, well, there's also a like black only... hole of time called COVID. That <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was like seven. It's five years plus two for COVID. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So you, I don't know if you need like a break. Like, how do you when you have something this not grueling, but like with all these different things that are hard. The police are being hard. The um the family is um, yeah. like sh- showing so much emotion and it, it, it's a part of it. Um, how do you, how do you like reset the battery so you can, you know, do another thing like this? Cause it's, it sounds like yeah. movies are a bit of a battle because you have to like get the money, you have to get the, yeah. all these things to come together. And then you have to get a bunch of people who maybe, you know, someone comes to work one day and they're like grumpy or something, you know, and you have to, right, right, right. <laughs> so you have to handle it, that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, th- this is probably as, as challenging as a movie will get. I mean, it was a six year battle to get it made. Um, where the financing came together and fell apart multiple times. Um, yeah. And, you know, part of that challenge is, look, I could take it as a filmmaker because I'm working on other projects and, you know, you just know that this is the nature of the beast. Again, this is where it became very challenging to have a family awaiting this process because every time that the that we were close and then it fell apart, it, it, it broke their hearts a little bit, almost like people didn't want to tell their son's story, you know, and I had to go deliver that news. So it was, it was a lot of emotions. We finally got to production. Other than the police thing, production was beautiful. And, and I know it was beautiful because something happened that doesn't happen very often, which is the entire cast is still close, still till this day. Like they'll all visit each other. They all come here to visit me. Um, that doesn't usually happen. I mean, you know, it's, it, you know, most, most, films are are like a circus, you know, you kind of go from town to town and whatever. And, um, and everybody still has a special feeling from that movie. Um, but anyway, once the, once we wrapped production within two weeks, I was doing post-production, which took, you know, a normal amount of time, about eight, nine months. Um, and we wrapped and, you know, we, we, we were supposed to have a huge premiere in Miami. I mean, huge. It was at this old theater in Miami that sees about 1500 people. Theater was sold out. Um, we had, every press coming, we had uh, all these distribution people coming and it was, you know, the release date of, I mean, the day of the premiere was March 12th and um, March 11th. I'm the, the Miami film festival has started. I'm at a party at the March 11th and I'm getting a thousand texts. So everybody's worried about this virus. You know, is this about to come? You know, I'm worried. Can I go sit in a theater? And I'm sitting with the president of the university that sponsors a festival. And, and I, I say to him, I'm like, are you sure this is happening tomorrow? And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, totally. Look around. Everyone's here. This is nothing. It's in China, you know, whatever. Um, And that's it. By by midnight, I believe the news had come out that um, Tom Hanks got COVID um, Mm -hmm. and and that was it. Woody had COVID and, you know, the world got shut down. And so by 11 o'clock in the morning, we were canceled and quarantine started. Um, So to answer your question with a very long answer, uh, it was almost like a self-imposed, uh, actually not self-imposed, I mean, world-imposed uh, pause. And it was such a gift for me. I mean, it really was such a gift. It was it was like a moment where there was, there was no point in rushing and working. There was no FOMO. There was no nothing. It was just me and my husband and the kids. And we spent the next three months, you know, going on walks and cooking and trying to figure out what was going to happen to the world. Um, but it was, it was a beautiful time for me personally. Thank God everybody was healthy, you know, around us and our families were healthy. Um, so it was a time where I really kind of got to recalibrate and just spend time with my kids and cook and be home. And, you know, I, I kind of, I really saw it for me as a, as a gift at that, at that moment, you know, um, I don't, 
I feel bad saying that because there was so much suffering happening in the world, but that was just what was happening in, in my, in my personal household. Um, so that was a lot of healing. I mean, after that, I, I, it, it was, it, we were trying to figure out what to do with the movie. You know, nobody knew what to do with their movies. We weren't alone in that boat. I mean, the, you know, everyone was trying to figure out like, do you sell the movie? Do you hold the movie? You know? Um, and so we spent about a year holding on to the movie. That's what we were advised to do. And then a year later, you know, companies were gobbling up a lot of content because people were still home. Um, and so HBO approached us and, and mm -hmm. they, they, they came with a great offer. And, and so we sold the movie to them. And look, sadly, I would have loved to see it do what it was supposed to do and have its theatrical run and do, you know, what it needed to do. But HBO has been wonderful and they, they were really supportive of the movie and we actually just sold it to Disney for Latin America. And, um, so the movie, the movie keeps going, you know, but, mm -hmm. But anyway, to answer your question, it 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 was COVID. It was all that time, and 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 it took a little bit of healing. And then along that time, somewhere in COVID, um, I was introduced to a woman, and they said it was a studio out of LA, and and they said, you know, come up with a film that that we could we could get behind, and it was something in music because the the woman works in music, um, and and we did, and that that was such a different process. It was it was just full of joy and fun. And, and I, I'm a, I love music so much. And so it was wonderful with her coming up with a, with a, with a film based in the music world. And um, yeah, so that's what I've been working on the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. How does, uh, just to deconstruct some of these, uh, some of the things you said, how does HBO approach you? Do they just have like your email on file? Like how do they find, yeah. how do they know who you are and approach you? Uh, well, actually funny enough, one of the, one of the HBO buyers was supposed to be at the premiere. Um, mm. so I think she already did have my contact information from that, but no, we went through um, William Morris Endeavor. They they were representing the film and they sent it out to a bunch of buyers. Um, eventually, a, a product a distribution company, Vertical Entertainment, bought the film, and so they they were essentially almost like an aggregator where they are, they then uh, sent it out to the different uh, streamers. Is it is it hard? Is it like complex to handle that side of the business? Like you have the thing made. It needs to find a home, it needs to find an audience, but then you have like all these people that like come in and become aggregators, so then they sell it and do stuff like that. Um, is it like it's I don't, I can't, I don't, process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it sounds kind of frustrating because then like the, the, the food is done, but then you right. have everyone else coming into the kitchen, yeah, and, and and they're kind of like critiquing you, and then they're you know getting their own percentages and stuff like that. And it's like, well, I don't know. I made the cake. Yeah. Why can't you guys? Yeah, just... it's tricky. It's tricky. I mean, the, the hardest part is you have to deliver the film and mm. to deliver the film is, is an insane amount of work. It really is, especially yeah. for an independent film that doesn't have a huge team behind it. Um, it, it's just, it's a lot of work, but, but no, it, it's not, it's not terrible. I mean, it's, listen, you're at, at least in our case, we were so happy that people wanted it and that, um, they wanted to, you know, really take it out on, on a major platform and we were a tiny movie, you know? So, so um it was fine that that actually it wasn't it wasn't too bad okay and are yeah. you going to be like quentin tarantino where you, you say you're only going to do like 10 films or do you have any like structure to your life in terms of your, how you want your career to be i'll take any sentence that has me and quentin tarantino in the same sentence <laughs> um yeah no i i have no idea you know what up till now i mean uh look i don't know how to say this in a in a politically correct way being a woman is not, is not the easiest, you know, um, in, in a lot of probably in most careers, but, but definitely not a career like this one. Um, I, I, I had the choice many years ago, you know, whether I kept traveling back and forth to LA and tried to promote myself and my career as many directors get to do, or I, I spent time at home, you know, and, and, you know, my husband has a pretty big career himself and I had two kids to raise and I decided I would focus on writing and, do um, some short films just to keep playing with technology and and keep keep it relevant, so to speak. But I, I I did have to give up a lot as far as propelling my career in a in a fast forward motion to to stay home and really be there for the kids, which I wanted to. I mean, nobody forced me to do that. I I really wanted to. I felt that that was my one shot to create two great humans, and they are they they really are. They're they're two incredible humans. So now they're finally they're bigger and. Um, I was able to get refund done and now I have three projects coming up. Um, and so we'll see. I don't, I don't, I would never shut down an opportunity only because I, I, I do feel like I've spent the last 10 years on a little bit of pause, you know, or at least taking mm. it in slow motion so I could be home. 
is there so i've never been a like a, a mom at home with her kids but yeah. i imagine there's start i mean that there's a lot of there's a huge population in the united states who does stuff like that i feel like there's yeah. there might be stories there too that you can draw on for the for other things that you do moving forward so you know yeah. um it's called wine and melatonin <laughs> really <laughs> no <laughs> no not at all um no yeah of course i mean listen i know i i know tons of uh, stay at home moms you know mm -hmm. um and, and a lot of them are women that I, I think that especially my age group, you know, I'm, I'm mid forties. I think my age group is a really interesting generation where we were kind of born into that post feminist generation, right. Um, where we, we, a lot was expected of us, you know, get, get as good grades as boys get, you know, try to, you know, get um, a career like a boy, uh, like a man, you know, and, and get into good colleges and do, you know, and, and try to work, you know, like a man and be competitive with men in, in, in the job environment. And yet a lot of us found ourselves in our twenties or thirties with, you know, with a yearn to, to have, have babies and, and, and be home with them and raise them. And, and we felt it. And that's, it's a, it's a nature thing. You know, you just, you, you, and so I have a lot of friends who are these incredibly smart um, women who who spent many years focused on their careers and then kind of U-turned um, and are now, you know, focused on raising their kids. And it's very easy to kind of throw away the idea of a stay at home mom. Mm -hmm. Few people realize, you know, that these women could have had a successful career as their husbands do, you know, or as many other men do. And it was a choice. Yeah, I heard I heard of uh, I've heard because I'm not of the population, but I've heard that when you make that choice that some feminist people will give you static for making a family the priority. Mm -hmm. Is that is that? Yeah, is that true? Yeah, I listen, I, I'm, I'm sure there is I never really stopped working, you know, um, yeah. I just had to alter it to to be able to, to fit the lifestyle that I was I was leading at that moment, you know, so I, I definitely I took some hits, you know, career wise, where there was some years where I had peers that were, you know, in LA going out every night and, and it pays off. It really does. You know, anybody who says it doesn't is delusional. You know, they, they, you know, there, there is something when you're out there, you're, you're going to get, you're going to get more work than being, you know, hundreds of miles away in a, you know, doing carpool. Um, yeah. but, but it's okay. You know, it was, it was something I, I felt that I needed to do. So I, I never really encountered that with, with feminist friends, you know, because probably I never stopped working. Um, but there is, there's definitely a, a looking down upon to women that, that choose to, to just, to, to just stay home and, and, and focus on their families. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it sucks that someone would think that people who are stay at home moms or make kids their priority are less than the other member of yes. the pair, like the, the, the husband or whomever, um, like that, that's a really hard skill to have. And yeah. it's, it's been proven in like almost every study. Like I, I'm a science nerd. It's like, it's been proven in every study. Like, like men and women are like equally capable and like right. can do great things. And it, it sucks that people put each other down in that way versus being like, Hey, she's doing something really cool. Like that's, yeah. that's neat. Yeah. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, it, it, kids really do require time. They, 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 yeah. you know, and especially in this day and age where, you know, before, like, you know, when we were growing up, you would go out on your bicycle and go to a friend's house. And there was definitely an innocence to that. It's not so innocent when you, your kids can get into chat rooms or on video yeah. games and, you know, so, so there is a, there is a, I, f I feel like a larger need to really kind of be present and, and be able to be there and, and talking to them and, and hearing what's, what's actually going on, you know? Yeah. I, I I've heard that in the, like there's been a shrinking of, I guess, like the sandbox that kids can play in as yeah. time has gone on. Like in the 50s and 60s, apparently like, they could just roam like wild gazelles. Right. <laughs> and, and nowadays it's like you need to like have someone kind of keeping an eye on as they go to school. And people, yeah. it's not community minded anymore. That's what I'm hearing. It's like your kids are your kids. But right. if like they, they were walking by someone else's house and like someone tried stopping them or whatever, like the person whose house that's in front of would just go about their day potentially. Like there's not like a community mm -hmm. sense of like, hey, th th that's a – my fellow citizen, you know, like let's at least call the cops or something or make sure they're okay. Most people like either they're like, they stick their nose in in like a Karen-ish way. I know like a yeah. like Kevin-ish way is like the, the male version uh -huh. or they like, they completely stay out of it. And, and, um, it's not like in the fifties and sixties, I think like people, like anyone would yell at your kids yeah, 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 and yeah. make you roam and stuff. Yeah. 
Well, I think that there's also a fear, you know, of yeah. being yelled at as the adult, you know, of getting mm-hmm. involved with someone else's kids. I mean, listen, there's wonderful parents out there. There's crazy parents out there. You know, there's parents that, um, just like you're saying, you might be wanting to do something to help their child, but they don't want you helping their child, you know? And so I think people are very like, they're, they're, they're almost right to be like a little bit more reserved, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, because you, you never know what you're encountering. Now, having said that, if you see a kid in danger, anybody should be helping, you know, um, obviously, but, but I, I, I do understand the feeling of not always getting involved. Yeah. When I was in college, there was, um, there was some, every now and again, there'd be like a woman who's walking alone at night. Uh-huh. And I, I don't know, like I told you, I told this story earlier, like during COVID I shaved my head. So I look scary, but even mm-hmm. with my head not shaved, I don't know yeah. what it is. People walk around me like I'm a dog that's going to bite them. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not scary, but people, my wife notices it too. That's really <laughs> it's funny. Like, apparently I look scary, but when it's at night and people are alone, they'll go up to me like, hey, can you, like my house is like right there. Can you just like, could you walk me home? It's like, yeah, it's fine. Oh, that's nice. Do you want to like tell you, you want to tell your friends that you're being walked home by a strange man or something? Right, just exactly, so, like, you know, you're exactly. Yeah. Um, that's so funny. like, it, it doesn't take much. It's like, I'm just stretching my legs. I feel like yeah. if it, if it takes like 20% extra and it's really not that big of a deal, like just help out other people. It's kind of right, nice. Right. <laughs> it's kind of funny too, <laughs> to like, uh, out of nowhere, like there's, Sometimes they literally come out of the showers like, hello, I'm like, kind of lost. <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you help me find my home? It's like, yeah, it's fine. Oh, where is it? Like, you know where you live and stuff? Um, yeah. Um, Grant, I live in the Midwest, so it's a, maybe it's a little different than, than the coast. Um, is it when, you, when you're 100 miles away and you're working on carpooling versus um, like networking, like what Jamie Foxx, Jamie, there's this great story with Jamie Foxx where like he would have like parties. Uh-huh. And he'd have like a sound studio and he kept being uh-huh. like, oh, we should totally sing because he wanted to get into the music industry. Okay. So he'd have parties that were great. And then you'd have people sing and then you'd have a studio there. And he was just kind of like, hey, I'm here, guys. Yeah, and then yeah, eventually yeah. Like Kanye West Kanye West got him in a song and like, you know, things went from there. But um, so being there, being able to network in that way, being uh-huh. 100 miles away, were there tricks or tips that you'd have for people going through a similar situation Um to still be a part of it because you're still working, you're still finding a way to somewhat network and still yeah. have opportunities come your way, but it's not the same. How, how would, how would you advise people to balance that if they, they can't be, you know, they're like Jamie Foxx or like yeah. they're at the parties, right. but they, they still want to have an active participation and, and, you know, progress their career. Yeah. I mean, listen, well, first writing obviously is, is a lot easier, you know, in the, in the Mm -hmm. sense that you could do it from anywhere. There's a ton of screenplay contests and submission contests, you know, that you could, that you could stay active in, in those as a writer Um, and directing. Okay. I would argue that there's still a world in which, you know, community made films exist and people want them, you know, people still want films that, that tell a unique story and have a sense of place. Um, So I, I wouldn't be scared of of staying within the world that you know and telling those stories. You know, the, the hardest part is the financing. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it, in in South America or Europe or Israel, there's government grants to tell a lot of these stories. You know, and and the government grants pay for a large part of the production. Unfortunately, in the U.S., that doesn't exist. You know, the art grants that, that exist are just not enough to piece together a film, maybe a short film. You know, um, some states have better tax incentives, so at least you could count on those. Um, we in Florida don't. We we used to have a great tax incentive. We lost it several years ago. Um, but there is if you can piece it together, whether it's like we did, you know, some friends and family, some crowdfunding, some, you know, community stuff, some cast members just throwing in, you know, their their work for free, crew members throwing in their work for free. You could still get it done. You know? How big are the I've heard of this grant thing, but I don't know. Like no one in my Googling, I could not find numbers. Is it like a significant amount when you go to other countries like New Zealand and stuff or South America? Will um, they give you grants to like tell stories? You know, I, I have some friends in Mexico that are filmmakers and and Argentina as well. And yeah, I mean, I think it's enough to 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 finance the film. I mean, my friends in Argentina wow. apply for grants all the time, and it's those grants that are paying for the movies. Perhaps larger productions, they have independent production companies that are also helping finance them. Um, but I have friends that are are telling major stories only through the government financing. Listen, is that, um, the government should finance the arts. I mean, filmmaking is is you know is one of the arts, not completely financed, but there should be better grants out there for filmmakers. Yeah, I wonder how would they sift through all the applications. I, I think in ancient Rome, like the Romans, there was a couple of Roman uh, emperors that would go around, and every time they would they would go to, they would literally build an amphitheater, build a yeah. you know they they build out the arts, and they would go to the next town, build out the arts, right. go to the next town, build out the arts, go to the next town. It's like a like form of like a 
Roman Romanization, romanticization. I forget the name, but it's like a yeah. way of like ex, like bringing up the culture of the community while also being like, hey guys, we have some some cool things to offer. Yeah. And the, so I, I see the benefit of um, having a more supported art system. Though in schools and public system in particular, I don't think the arts are given the respect they're due. They're like they're cut before sports are cut, and I don't I know. Understand. Yeah, so they, like sport. Uh, no, I don't think art gives people concussions. <laughs> so right, right, I feel exactly, like of the two. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a friend. Actually, she's um, in the in the film Rifa. The 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 woman Vivian, who's his friend, is a real life person. Um, and she, the the real Vivian, is incredible. And she um, teaches art to several public schools, like especially you know really low income public schools. And um, you know they're there's nothing, there's no resources. Or there's absolutely nothing. Most of the programs have been cut and she does it as like an after school activity or summer or whatever, just to keep these get kids engaged in the arts. I mean, the research is really incredible about, you know, what a gift that is, especially when, when you don't have any other resources, you know, uh, what a gift it is to those kids and, and what an outlet it becomes for them. Yeah. It's a, it's basically teaching you how to communicate. Yeah. Like art is a way of communicating things that are complex. Right. So, and, and like, in high school, like the public system, they don't teach you how to communicate or get along with other people or even balance your 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 uh, your bank account or understand like what credit card debt's gonna do to you if you don't watch right, exactly, it. But exactly. there's they will tell you like I don't know like the history of like Ming China, but they won't tell you like these are the things you should do yeah. so that you don't get yourself in a bad position. And it could be like they one course. Do. I mean I you know oh, okay. they, when I was in public school, I mean, they, they, you know, I took home ec and accounting and whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a rarity now. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that, um, they got into a, a ton of credit card debt because they didn't understand. I mean, 20%, like most credit cards are like 20%. Yeah. It's like, I hate that. Yeah. I hate credit card debt. It's like giving the bank free money. It's like, it's my money and you're just facilitating it. Like get out, of, get out of here and, uh, don't come back. <laughs> um, uh, do, do you see yourself doing more of this independent type film? as you move forward or are you, um, as your kids are now, uh, leaving the nest, uh, are you going to like try to go to the more, uh, networking things and do bigger things? I think independence is big too. I just, I'm curious about like your yeah, mindset. Yeah, in terms yeah. Of how you move I, forward. So I have three projects coming up. The, the one yeah. I told you about the, the music project, uh, it's called redemption song. Um, and the script is done for that. We haven't gotten greenlit yet, but, um, that that will be backed by a studio, um, so that'll be bigger. So it'll be a definitely an interesting experience to have. I'm I'm excited for that. I I I've never I haven't shot a film that has any kind of money, um, so it'll be nice to be able to you know to know that the crew is properly fed and um, we you know we're we're we can scout the kind of talent that we want because we don't have those restrictions. That that part will be really fun. I don't know what it'll be like for me to have um a lot of different opinions creatively because up till now it's really just been me and the voice in my head um i haven't had that many opinions other than people that whose whose opinions i've asked you know like my editor or colorist or mm -hmm. people like that um so that'll be interesting um i have another uh film coming up that that i'm on slated to direct uh, which is an independent film about a social worker also based on a true story um it's it's based on a case out of new jersey where uh this little boy died on the social worker's watch and she went up against the state and eventually changed some of the laws in New Jersey. Um, and uh, finally, there's a there's uh, the last film I wrote, um, and and that one I'm about to start shopping around. Um, and I would say it's relatively independent in its spirit. Um, not to say that a, a studio or a streamer couldn't do it and and do it for a little bit more budget, but it, it definitely has an independent feel to it. Um, it would be nice again to do it with a little bit more money just so we could attract the kind of cast that we want. So I don't know, you know, I, it's, it's a strange world right now. You know, it's, 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 it's a really, it, you know, the other thing that's really funny with, with films and being a filmmaker right now is, you know, there was, there was always a sexiness to filmmaking, right? So you made this movie and whether or not your cast was big or not big or famous or not famous or whatever it was, you know, the film was done and, and, you know, you got somewhat of a theatrical run, whether it was a small theatrical run or a larger, you know, you, you could bank on a little bit of a theatrical run and it was like this film and it was going to come out and it was going to be in the theater and, you know, people knew about it and whatever. And now I feel like the job has become a little bit more of like a commonplace job in the sense that like you shoot something, you could spend all this energy on it, but then it, it goes up on one of the streamers. It goes up like 
hundreds of other projects are going up these days. And, and ultimately, you're just another little box on the streamer. Yeah. So I think if nothing else, it really amplifies the need for you to pick projects that you love. And you're doing it because you either you need the money and you want the money, which is valid. I mean, you know, it's work at the end of the day, or because you have a lot of passion behind that particular story and you want to tell that story. Because some of that sexiness is gone. And if you're doing it just for the applause or for um, the output, you know, it might not be what you wanted. You know, um, there's just too much content out there to have that kind of attention. Is it is it within your control or how would you um, have like a limited run in the theater? So I, even even um, it's like what you grew up seeing a movie. So yeah. to some extent, like if just being in the theater might be just one of those things that you look for, even if it is like a criterion for success to some extent. So yeah. um, is it is it something that you can control to make sure there is like a limited run of the theater so that, you know, people see it so you can go see it with your family and friends? Yeah, I, ish. I mean, with Reef in particular, no, because there was still. Mm. So so when we when we sold it to our initial distribution company, we did have in the contract that they were going to release it on limited theaters. At the end of the day, is it was our decision with the distribution company not to do that. Um, you know, it's still, it costs a lot of money for the production to, to be released in a, in a movie theater. You need, you know, you need advertisements, you need prints, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into it and it, nobody was going back to theaters yet. You know, it was, it was timing. Um, now would I make the same decision? Probably not. I would probably push to have it in some theaters because there is there, you know, it's still, it's cinematic. I mean, you you shoot these you you shoot these films thinking about the seventy foot screen, you know, and how they're going to look on that on that large screen. You don't really shoot them thinking about how they're going to look on someone's laptop. So, um, yeah, I would have loved to see it in a theater. Um, to answer your question, it kind of just depends on the production. It depends on the cast. It depends on how famous the director is, the producer is, all those things, you know. But listen, you see massive productions right now just going straight to streaming services without ever stopping at a theater so i don't know you know i still think there's nothing like the movie experience you know in a yeah. theater yeah, it can be good it can be bad and then west it in my experience has been generally good though i recently had oran on uh i don't know if you know him and uh, he, he was saying that he, he can't get good movie experiences because people are loud or late you know oh, talking right. on their phone or something like that um it's like oh that sucks uh get rid sure. of them yeah. yeah um if you is but when it's good like, it's incredible yeah I, I like i was just thinking like what was your first movie experience was it in a theater or was it in a drive-in movie theater i like drive movie theaters i'm not saying you're old enough to only be, be in drive movie theaters but uh was it the like the type where you're encased in something or was it the yeah. drive-in movie theater that was your okay, first so day you enjoyed so much? 46 so not that old um, <laughs> yeah, I, know. I, I was like she's not old enough for this yeah no no funny enough i've actually never been to a drive-in movie theater ever oh it's fun yeah I, I i've always wanted to go i've never been there was one in miami that existed many years ago i never ended up going to it um i've never been no my my um my no, my my first movie going experience was always in theaters. Um, mm. You know, there's there's a couple of standouts as there is to anybody else, but but yeah, that's why I'm saying like when it's good, it's really incredible. Like those those memories that you do have of of your early movies that really, you know, cut to your soul and made you made you just think about this as as a lifestyle. Um, that can only happen in, in I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's going to be kids 20 years from now that they're like, no, I was sitting at home and I saw these movies and I wanted to be a filmmaker. I don't know, you know, but, but for me seeing, seeing films as a kid, you know, films like ET and eventually dirty dancing and close encounters and star Wars, I mean, in, in a communal setting um, with the, with, with the energy, the palpable energy of everybody else kind of feeling the emotions that you were feeling. I don't think there's anything like that. Yeah. I'd recommend checking out a, a drive-in. They're they're neat. They're okay. like uh, they. I just think they're neat. Like it's a uh, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, Valentine's Day is coming up. I don't know if there's any ro romance stuff though. At the same time, I think you said there's none in Miami that do a drive-in. They were doing in Austin. They were doing a drive-in thing where they put a, a a film up on on the wall and they had people like drive into like parking lots so they could see movies right. because COVID was happening and stuff. Yeah, like, that's kind of that. fun. Actually, they did do that in Miami. Um, we we didn't end up going, but they did that, they, and it was pretty successful. I I think. Yeah. Um, for, uh, for people to, to, to what extent are you, do you read as well as make movies and stuff? Do you like, are you a book reader? Yeah, I love books. Okay, sweet. That, <laughs> that makes my next question easier. What are some books that you recommend people check out? It can be about film. It could just be about things that you enjoy. 
Oh shit. Um, okay. Awesome. <laughs> figure out my technology today. It's just not my friend right now. Um, <laughs> nothing is working the way I want it to work. Um, what are some books I, I recommend people? I mean, okay, hold on. I'm trying to remember what I've read. So, so recently I read two, um, books by this female author that they recommended to me, um, that were actually great. And I, I'm, I'm just looking on Amazon just cause I'm trying to remember the exact title. So I don't butcher the titles. Um, but I, I just read that actually, I think Blake Lively was cast in it. Um, let me see. I, I believe the author's name is Colleen Hoover and it was called, uh, oh yeah, it ends with us and it starts with us. Um, they were easy reads, really sweet books. Um, I really liked them. I thought that they were, they were fun. Um, there was one called like the, the, the wives of Evelyn Hugo, something like that, I believe. And that was really good too. Um, oh, Daisy Jones and the six coming out now on Amazon prime. I saw, um, that was a great book. That was a great book. Very reminiscent of almost famous, which is a film I love. Um, what else? Uh, I read a couple of Malcolm Gladwell books, uh, recently, which I, which I really enjoyed. I had never read outliers. Um, mm -hmm. oh, and then a completely different spectrum on, on a political spectrum. Um, there's a book that, that I really love called Red Notice. Um, and it's a book, uh, by his name is Bill Browder. Um, he was a, a U.S. diplomat in Russia and he, it, he basically kind of uncovers, um, you know, a lot of what was happening with, with, you know, some of the, the, the oligarchs in Russia. Um, and he, he ends up creating the Bagninsky Act, um, that ends up kind of like freezing Russian money in the United States over a friend of his that was killed in Russia. Um, really fascinating book. Not sure how that book hasn't been optioned yet into a movie. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love political books. I love political thrillers. Um, there's not as many as I wish there was. Um, but and I love, um, you know, I, I, I love a good romantic comedy. So all over the gamut on that one. Is is almost famous the one where they were going west with Lewis and Clark, or is it the, the one where the lady was trying to be a superstar? No, almost famous is the one which you have to watch. One of the best movies of all time. Uh, it is. Uh, it's about it. It's 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 really the an autobiography of Cameron Crowe, um, who's the writer and director. Um, he was a he was a young Rolling Stone writer, and he he. So in in the in the fictionalized version in the movie, he covers this band called Stillwater. Um, it's it's what it's Kate Hudson's first big role. Um, she played you know this this groupie uh, by the name of Penny Lane. Great movie, mm. it's a great great movie. Yeah, I, I definitely have not seen it. Then I swear yeah. there's like an almost famous or something like that where it's um it was like came out in the nineties early two thousands where it's a bunch of people trying to be like Lewis and Clark and they keep yeah. like fighting eagles and stuff. It's like a it's a comedy. It's not a rom com. Okay. Um, yeah. Not sure about that one. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I'm thinking of the right thing now. Yeah. I'm gonna have to Google it after this. If anyone knows what I'm talking about, please send it to me. It's it's uh it's like a Lewis and Clark thing. Yeah. Uh, your recommendations are better than mine. Um, okay. <laughs> the I can't think of any rom coms that are coming out that are like jumping. My wife and I keep trying to find movies. That's the thing. Yeah. Like at a movie theater, there's not that much coming out anymore. There's like like Puss in Boots or or some like yeah. uh, stuff like that. But like I remember when there used to be like like ten things a week, and you could just like kind of like menu it. I know. I just actually went to the movies by myself uh, the other day um, in the middle of the day to watch uh, The Fablemans, which is Steven Spielberg's new movie. Um, highly, highly recommended. I thought it was absolutely beautiful and I and really deserves to be watched in a, in a theater. Uh, just a, a quick question on everyone. Check these out. You have to you have the Saturday um, mm -hmm. to, to see these things. Um, is there so I know there's types of actors. So there's like method actors. There's not method actors, I guess the, the two types that I know, um, are kid. How, how do you go about getting the best of the different types? Like if they're just like, if you look at it from a high level, I'm sure there's like nuances to the different yeah. like people and how they like to be spoken to. But like, have you, the different types like method, not method. I'm sure there's more than that. Um, is there other ways as a director, producer, writer to like talk to someone who like I'm thinking like Daniel Day Lewis is like being like Abraham Lincoln and he has everyone referred to him as the president. It's like, okay, it's Daniel Day Lewis. So you just do what he says. Right. But like, uh, um, is there any like pointers for people who are going to make films and there's different types of actors like that. And just on like a, a high level, how to like get the best out of the different ways that the actor tries to get the best out of the what's written on paper. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I, personally, I, I'm of the belief that 90% of your job is casting the right actor. I mean, if you mm -hmm. cast the right actor, 
they're, they're going to do most of the work, most of the heavy lifting themselves. You know, the good actors will do their homework. You know, they'll, they'll create whether they're journals or diaries or just thoughts in their head of how that actor truly thinks, you know, in the, in the most profound ways. Um, I always think that you can tell if an actor is a really good actor, you know, when, when the camera isn't supposed to be on them and they're still thinking like they're still present in the scene and they, you know, they're, they're still a real person with thoughts. It's not just like, let me deliver my lines. Okay. Now it's your turn. Now it's my turn. It's table tennis. And, you know, and it kind of ends the minute my lines are over. Um, so anyway, so yeah, I, I, it has to be instinctual to a certain, to a certain point. I think that the most important thing is to, um, be very careful in the advice that you're giving them, you know, try to imagine yourself in, in their shoes and, and not be giving them opposing advice, you know, and not be giving them too much advice, you know, like it has to be things that, that are very specific. You know, I, I like to, to, to help them more in the sense of, um, let's work on what was happening right before the scene and what's going to happen right after the scene, because I feel like it gives them a sense of place and it gives them a sense of, you know, where they really are in that moment in the, in their lives, you know, versus, you know, the technical stuff. I mean, you, you kind of work out that morning, you know, you, you get to set, you, you work with the DP or, you know, or whoever else. And, and you kind of sit there, you block them, let the actors kind of find their flow and then help, help block them. But when they're struggling or they're not finding the truth in that moment or the truth in that scene. Um, I like to try to talk it out with them and, and try to figure out, you know, um, where was that person? What were they doing right before they walked in the room? It kind of sets them into the right mind frame. And usually with that, they can find their, their truth, you know, versus giving them very specific advice. Like you should be smiling right now, or you should be frowning right now, you know, unless you know that for a certain moment that you're you're going to cut to somebody else and you need them doing a specific action. It's more about them discovering mm -hmm. um, what their truth is. Yeah. I was listening to a, an interview uh, about October Sky. It's like a, a yeah. movie about rockets. Movie. And um, yeah. and it was Hall who was saying that he was acting, but he was like <laughs> yelling and stuff. <laughs> he was yelling and stuff. But then the other actor, the older guy, I forget his name, he was saying, stop yelling and yell at me. Like, instead of just like doing the lines, like yeah. have the argument with me and that like Jalen Hall was basically just like saying things on paper and trying yeah. to act them. Exactly. Um, but, but not like speaking to the person, yeah. like the, the other actor. And then um, there's something about like over emoting. Apparently people who are like just coming out of colleges or whatever for acting, they right. over emote. I'm not, yeah. I, I'm not entirely sure what that means. I think they just like smile more than they should. Um, yeah, I like, think it's also maybe if you've done a lot of theater, you know, I mm. mean, film is a very small medium in the sense that it's going to catch every single thing you're going to do. Whereas, you know, when you're in the theater, you really do need to over everything. Um, yeah. And, and I think it's, it's, that's a little switch that, that it, it takes actors a little bit. Is there, um, so I thought uh, Rifa was very well shot. Yeah. Is there, um, when you look at other filmmakers like Scorsese, or Spielberg, it, in your eyes, as like it's kind of like um, like an artist knows like shades of a color. Like my wife and I will be looking at colors, and she's like, "That's turquoise," yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, "That's teal to me." But uh, um, so like, you can see the gradations of color. Um, what do you feel is like? Are you able to see the differences in other filmmakers in terms of how they do stuff and then incorporate it in your stuff? I mean, it's kind of an obvious question, but at the same time, I'm kind of curious, like how what is the difference between like an average director and someone like yourself or Scorsese or a Spielberg? Cause they're, they're all telling stories and they're using like film to do it. And from my eyes, it all looks like, like, like I can tell when like someone's black or white or whatever, but sometimes I'm just like, this is teal. And some yeah, people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like, yeah, no, I, I totally understand what you're saying. I mean, I think that um, there, there's a huge difference in the way that things are shot and the way that um, certain directors use the camera to tell their stories, you know, and other directors just have the camera there, you know, as a tool. Um, I mean, Scorsese and Spielberg, you're talking about two of the masters in the way that they use their cameras. I mean, their cameras are part of the dance. Um, mm. whereas, you know, in, in other cases, it, it kind of is just there as, as, as a mechanism to, you know, relay the story from like a live action into, you know, the, the, the film molecules or whatever. Um, I, I, you know, with Rifa in particular, we really focused a lot on the color um, and the color palette of the film. Um, he liked to paint with the color gold. And, you know, I thought that gold was also like a very good, um, just, uh, you know, metaphor for for everything in his life. You know, he was the golden child. He was, you know, um, the, the 
golden friend. I mean, whatever, you know? And so we, we did, we, we debated a lot what camera we were going to use. We debated a lot, whether we should shoot on film, you know, or, or on, you know, shoot it digitally. We ultimately decided digitally. I would have loved to shoot on film. My first film we shot on 35 millimeter, but this one in the interest of time, I mean, we really had to run and gun a lot. So in the interest of time, we decided to, to shoot it digitally, but we did pick an, a, a camera that we thought would, um, would absorb you know, the, the colors that we were, we were trying to leak into it through, through different, you know, different filters, different emulsions. Um, and so that was very important to us. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that for me, I'm, I'm, I'm hyper aware of where the camera is at all times in films when I'm, when I'm watching them, you know, and, and I realize it when I'll say to my family, we're watching a movie and I'll say, God, that was such a beautiful shot. And I realized that they just took it for granted. You know, they, mm -hmm. they, they took it for granted as part of the story. When I realized that, that, that was, you know, that was a dance. I mean, that was someone trying to tell the story in a very specific way, using the camera as a way to tell that. Is there a qualitative difference that you can observe between film and digital? But does it actually look different? Different? You know, I, I do. I think there is. I mean, there was something in the graininess of like a film mm. that's shot on film, you know, that it feels very artistic to me. Um, the new digital cameras are beautiful and some of them can get close, you know, but then there's other cameras or other ways of shooting that almost seem too hyper-realistic that it almost feels like you're watching a soap opera, hmm. you know? Um, yeah. And then, um, how do people, like if someone has a filmmaker, other than just like having a Google alert for their names, is there, what's a good way to stay up to, to date with the stuff that you're working on? Like, I, I imagine IMDB is like the LinkedIn for yeah, our exactly. people, but I also have never used it. So I don't know. Is that yeah. like, a, like, so it is, it's, it's kind of the Mecca for any information, especially IMDb pro when, when you get a little more specific into production companies, agents, things like that. Yeah. I've always, <clears throat> I used to make this joke that, uh, are you familiar with, um, DB Cooper? The, yeah, the uh, yeah. I, I made the joke that he, um, he survived uh -huh. and he made, um, a social network to like hide his identity <laughs> But he wanted to be cheeky about it, so he made IMDb. Oh, that's um, really funny. <laughs> yeah, I said it to the to a bunch of scientists the, the first time I said it, and they looked at me was like, "What? Why would he? <laughs> they looked at it a little too literally?" Um, but so it, it, the best way to follow along with your developments is to get on I'm just like keep an eye on IMDb. You don't yeah, have like a newsletter. Instagram, it's, Instagram, I feel is 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 pretty good these days. You know, um, especially if you follow someone's personal Instagram, you kind of know what they're doing. Um, but yeah, either Instagram or IMDb, um, both good options. I, yeah. I look, IMDb, for example, like these three projects that that I'm working on right now, I haven't even put them on IMDb yet just because they're all still relatively in development. So um, I don't know, maybe it, I, I'm probably the worst person to ask these questions to because I'm, I'm so bad about this stuff. But yeah. 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 I, I recently got an Instagram and I post like nothing. I just, just like to connect and see what other everyone else is doing. Or, yeah. or in the last filmmaker who was on. Uh, suggested starting one it's like okay i'll do it but i don't understand the medium and there's like it's nice to follow people like it's basically like my the timeline is like people like you and huh. then food because i look for exactly. food ideas don't worry, that, i feel like i'm not doing it right yeah yeah um as a, as a filmmaker would you ever do like a newsletter or something like that where you can keep people like hey i'm doing this type of stuff because I, I feel like people would like if you like told these types of stories in like a little like four point newsletter yeah. every now and again like it i think it'd be pretty cool be good, but Again, I'm I'm probably the worst when it comes to that stuff. I mean, any yeah. kind of self promotion or anything, I just I'm busy. I I, I don't know. I, I I mean to do it, and then I just forget to. That's fair. If it yeah. if it doesn't feel right, then don't. That's when people do newsletters. I just say like find a way to make it fun. If it right, can't be fun, right. then don't do it. Totally. You have so many other things to do on your time. Exactly. Um, <laughs> is there a quote or a movie you would leave us with to think about? Shit, these like questions on the spot. Um, a quote or a movie to think about. Um, I'm sure there are, and I probably have about a thousand of them, but I can't really remember. Uh, no worries. I yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, look, I, I, I hope the audience keeps watching movies. You know, I, I mean, that, that's what I would say. You know, I, I TV is incredible now, and there's so much talent in television. Um, but there's something about being transported to a story that has a beginning, middle and end, you know, within a limited amount of time. Um, and I hope that, that, you know, I, I see it with my kids right now, you know, my kids don't watch as much movies as they watch TV shows, you know, and, and yeah. it's, 
there's something to their attention to just being under 60 minutes that they can handle and that movies seem daunting to them. Um, and I, I hope that changes because I, I, I think it's still such an incredibly beautiful art form that um, I hope our attention spans don't get more limited in space where, where our movies have to be limited to TikToks. Thank you for joining us today with the Learn With Lowell show. Check us out at learnwithlowell.com. Anywhere podcasts can be found, subscribe. Tell me what you thought of this episode. Check us out on YouTube in particular. It's a new thing I'm doing. Uh, Timestamps and links are in the show notes. Thank you for coming. And I hope everyone, every one of you found something today that you're curious about to learn more about. And you'll go out and be curious and learn something new. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.